We uh, are here for a reason. We are here to walk through the uh, teaching of the end of the world. And we're beginning a new series as you just heard this song sing. It's the end of the world as we know it. And we're gonna look to the Bible concerning how the world as we know it will end, where we are in that timeline and what we're supposed to do about it. And uh, how many are looking forward to this series, amen? Now, I wanna preface this series with a few statements. Uh, the first one being that this series is really collectively just one large sermon uh, that is going to take six weeks to preach. And so even at the end of this message, it's gonna feel incomplete. Does that make sense? Because there's more to share, and I've got a lot more to say, but none of us have an ability to sit through a one teaching that lasts six hours. Amen. And all the believers said, amen. Some of you said that a little too loud, but that's all right. Amen. Uh, but we don't have the ability to retain it all, and so we're going to be breaking it up the best way we can so that we can remember it. Now, also, there is a lot of viewpoints around this particular subject, a lot of different uh, opinions, a lot of beliefs that surround this topic from within church and out of the church as far as how it will end. Come on, somebody. People have said how the world will end. Will it end uh, with, with an alien takeover? Come on, was Tom Cruise right all along? And will he be our saving grace in this? Or, or, or some of you know, like those old black and white movies, uh, On the Beach. Anybody know what I'm talking about that movie? Like, will the world end from radiation poisoning caused by the catastrophic World War III that is inevitable and coming? Or, or come on, somebody, let's go more modern day. Are we all infected? and destined to roam the earth like zombies, amen, and Rick Grimes and Curl is our only hope, amen. Uh, or will it be like Armageddon? Come on, somebody. I can confidently tell you that the world will not end with Bruce Willis giving his life so that Ben Affleck can make out with his girlfriend to Steven Tyler singing Don't Wanna Miss a Thing. I can, I can pretty much bank on that not happening, amen. Uh, but we're gonna dig into how it all goes down because the Bible talks about how it will all go down. And so in theology, uh, we call this subject eschatology. Looks like a fancy word, it's not, it's just a Latin word. Ology means study of, esca means end of things. And so that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna study about the end of things. And so uh, as we get started, let me give you another preface statement here in saying that the only viewpoint that we will ever and always take and present on this topic right here at Journey is the viewpoint of Scripture, wherein we see a beginning and we see an end. That's what we see. And, and, and we view life as we know it to be and its timeline through the lens of God's Word. And this we know looking at God's word, is that the world that you and I know and live in will one day come to an end. We know this because Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 35, when he said, heaven and earth, come on, the world as we know it to be, and even outside of what we see it to be, I mean, no, heaven's included in this, and that might be Quite a wild thing to read, but we're gonna explain all that in this series. It says that heaven and earth will pass away, meaning one day come to an end. And the preceding factor to all of that will be when Jesus Christ physically comes back to the earth a second time before it all happens. How many know Jesus Christ is not physically here anymore? Acts chapter one says he ascended. Paul expounds on this in Ephesians chapter one when he says, this is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead, watch this, and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. So where is Jesus Christ 
physically located at right now, right? Heaven, right? Seated at the right hand of the Father. He came physically 2,000 years ago, and he walked this earth for 33 years during his ministry, died on a cross, rose again, and ascended into heaven. Acts chapter one, verse nine, details that ascension moment when it says that Jesus was taken up before the disciples' very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly, here comes the message of heaven, two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? Watch this. This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And that comeback moment will be the moment when the end of the world, according to scripture, truly begins to unpack itself. Which begs the question then, when is Jesus gonna come back? And let me just give you that answer. And for those of some of y'all are versed in this, so you already got the jump on me on this one. We don't know. We don't know when he's gonna come back, amen? So please don't get up and leave right now. Like, oh man, that's why I came, unreal. We don't know that you just walk out screaming in the lobby. We don't know, we don't know. Let's go to Chubby's, amen, or whatever. We, we really don't know, but, but that doesn't leave us hanging, because watch this. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 36, but about that day or hour, speaking of the moment when he comes back, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, speaking of himself, but only the Father, which that is so intriguing. And, 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 and I don't have the time nor the ability to even attempt to explain that, but one thing we know is that the knowledge of when Christ will come back only rests in the mind of God the Father, which to me just powerfully affirms the doctrine and belief and teaching of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, each of them God, yet as we see here, each of them separate from themselves. Now, that doesn't leave Jesus nor anyone of us hanging on the season that this will all go down. He says, yeah, you don't know the day or the hour, but he doesn't leave you hanging on the season that that's gonna happen in. Because he says in verse 44, you must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. In other words, Jesus is saying, we don't know when it's exactly going, or uh, uh, you don't, you're not gonna know exactly when it happens, but be ready for it to happen. And after he says that, Watch me, he provides a preparatory timeline, so to speak, on when you can expect the season and how to know whether or not you're in the season that he will come back in to arrive and to be around you. Luke chapter 21, if you got your Bibles, uh, you can turn them with me to Luke chapter 21. I have all the scriptures for you on the screen. Uh, reading out of the NLT version here, Luke chapter 21, we're gonna read quite a few verses here. Uh, this is also one of those series you're really gonna wanna take advantage of the message notes in the JC app, because I've got all the scriptures for you, points, uh, I even summarize and expound on, on some of them that I, I, I would not have time to do here on Sunday mornings in these sermons. Uh, so take advantage of those. You can also send those notes to yourself, text them to yourselves, email them to yourself. They're just there, again, for your retention. Uh, Luke chapter 21 and verse five reveals this scene where Jesus breaks into a really powerful end time teaching, but it starts with the disciples, it says they're talking about the temple. They're like looking at the majestic stonework of it, and they're like, man, these walls are incredible, look at the decorations on the walls, but look at what Jesus says while they're doing this, as if to say, quit focusing on things that are so temporary. Because look at what he says, the time is coming when all these things that you're oohing and on about will be completely demolished not one stone will be left on top of another. He's talking about the end of time. He's talking about when he comes back. Teacher, they said, when will all this happen? What sign will show us that these things are about to take place? He replied, don't let anyone mislead you. In other words, 
There's gonna be a lot of misinformation that's swimming your way when it comes to when the end of the world is going to happen. Many are gonna come in my name claiming that I'm the Messiah and saying the time has come, but don't believe them. And when you hear of wars and, uh, and, and insurrections, don't panic. Yes, these things must take place first, but the end won't follow immediately. Then he added, nation will go to war against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be allies, allied forces coming out against allied forces. There will be great earthquakes. There will be famines and plagues in many lands, and there will be terrifying things and great miraculous signs from heaven. Now I want to stop here because we just read a lot because Jesus just said a lot. And I want to look at context here. Context means let's look at the whole story. What is Jesus saying here? He's pointing to not only that these things are going to happen, he's preparing us for the understanding that these things are going to happen. If you look at the context of what he's saying in other places in God's word, it's not only that these things are going to happen, but also there's going to be an immense increase in these things happening so that the world as a whole may see it, all of them collectively happening simultaneously as a sign of his coming. Some of you were just reading that, and you're like, man, that was on ABC News last night. Like, it just seems like some of this stuff is just unfolding all the time. And, 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 and he digs into some of those things. He talks about false prophets, misinformation concerning the end of the world, little mini antichrists that are just gonna start to arrive everywhere. Again, I, I wish I had time to dig into this, but can I tell you, in the last 100 years, there has never been more national and worldwide attention given to this type of stuff, to, to the misinformation of the end of the world, to false prophets and, and antichrists and cults and people alike claiming to be Jesus, having the answers to all of this stuff that are not anchored in the teachings of Scripture, especially with the age of the Internet today. It is just flowing, man, like sewer through streets. It is wild to see and know that this Scripture has never had a season to have been lived out more than it is today. Jesus says there's also going to be earthquakes, and when you know he's saying that, if you dig into the context of that, it's, it's an increase. It's a dramatic increase in earthquakes. Scriptures like Matthew 24 and Daniel chapter 11 and the book of Revelation as a whole teach us and give us notice that there is going to be a dramatic rise in natural disasters like earthquakes, and, and that's today's cold, hard reality uh, and I'm not talking about just the earthquake we heard about in, in Newark and New York City, uh, but the National Earthquake Information Center now locates about 20,000 earthquakes a year that happen on the earth. 20,000 earthquakes a year. That's 55 a day, friends. And the most trusted seismologists who study what they call the scar tissue of the earth's crust claim that those numbers today vastly outweigh seismic activity that happened even just 100 years ago. In fact, today's 20,000 earthquakes a year outnumber earthquakes that happened 100 years ago by 11 times as much. I mean, no, we're living closer to the end times than we've ever lived. He also says that there's going to be great famines. Can I just tell you, because we may think about this in America and be like, well, where, I don't see much famine. Can I tell you the statistics on world hunger alone and famines are sobering, that there are in virtually every nation on earth, dras outside of America, and it's not that there isn't hunger issues in America, but I'm telling you, there are nations that are starving right now, experiencing famine, experiencing hunger in virtually every country outside of our own. There are pestilences, Jesus said. We just read pestilences. What are pestilences? The definition of a pestilence is a contagious or infectious epidemic of disease or virus. Come on, somebody. How many are like, all right, I get it. Let's move on. We've had enough of that. Verse 12, he says, but before all this occurs, there will be a time of great persecution as well. He's saying you'll be dragged into synagogues and prisons and you'll stand before, uh, you'll stand trial before kings and governors. Who's he talking to? He's talking to Christians because he says you're gonna do this because you're my followers. But this will be your opportunity 
to tell them about me. So don't worry in advance about how to answer the charges against you, for I will give you the right words and such wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to reply or refute you. Even those closest to you, your parents, brothers, relatives, and friends will betray you. They'll even kill some of you, and everyone will hate you because you are my followers. It's a tough, tough stuff that Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying here that there's gonna be a time, a, a, an intense time in the end times of great persecution against Christians. Even within their own homes, they'll experience this before he comes back. And some of us are seeing that today. According to statistics put out by the Catholic Church, and, and this has also been verified by virtually every Protestant denomination, that there are today on the earth between 90,000 and 100,000 Christians killed for their faith in Jesus every year on this planet. Between 90,000 and 100,000 Christians killed. Not just like happenstance killed, I'm talking killed intentionally for their faith in Jesus. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of nations or kingdoms where it is illegal today to acknowledge Jesus Christ publicly. China's one of those nations. You're killed for your faith in China. There are people that meet in underground caves and churches right now just because if they were to publicize it, they would be ostracized, jailed, or killed for their faith. I don't know if we know this, but on Sunday morning right now in China, there are Christians meeting in caves, worshiping in caves. They don't have access to the Bible like we have. So they tear out little pages and pieces of the Bible and they walk with it folded up hidden in their pockets because if they're seen with it, they're killed. When they worship in, 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 in caves, they can't be heard. So they've, they've had pastors that learn sign language and they're teaching in sign language. They, they worship like this because if they're heard, they're killed. Friends, that's the cold hard reality of what's happening in the world today all because of Jesus and following Jesus, loving Jesus, and he warned us of this particular time. But look at what he says in verse 18. But not a hair of your head will perish. Well, what are you talking about, Jesus? You said we're gonna be killed. So Jesus is obviously not speaking out of two sides of his mouth here, because number one, you can look at my head and see that that's not true. Because I got hairs perishing on this head every single day. Bald brothers, amen. Don't leave me hanging. Thank you, Pete. Amen. All right. He's not talking of your physical condition. He's talking of your spiritual condition. That's why he says in the very next verse, by standing firm, you will win your souls. Meaning, friends, death in this life for a believer equals heaven forever for the soul of that believer. Amen. Let's head down to verse 27. Then, here we go now, after all this intense, crazy stuff happens, everyone will see the Son of Man coming on a cloud. Come on, isn't that what the two men dressed in white told the disciples that were looking up into the sky? That he's gonna come back to them just as he left. And he says, after all this stuff happens, you're gonna see that moment happen. He's gonna come on a cloud with power and great glory, so when all these things begin to happen, stand and look up, for your salvation is near. And so, here's my goal over the coming weeks. We're gonna comb through the timeline of the end times, and this journey is going to be, as it already has been a little bit, very informational. I see a lot of note taken, that's good. And we're gonna walk through it as scripture describes it. Let me give you another preface point. I just wanna say up front that I am not an expert in this word right here. I am not an expert in eschatology. I know we all want our pastor to be an expert in everything. Can I just tell you that's not possible. There are Bible colleges and, and theological universities that have complete tracks of study on this particular word right here. There are men and women that have bachelor's, master's, and PhDs in eschatology. I didn't get my major in eschatology. Mine was pastoral studies. I didn't get a minor in emphasis in eschatology. It was church history, not church future, amen. But, but that's not to say that, that I have not been diligent in my study over the last several years. So I want you to know, like, 
up here. There's not a eschatology for dummies book, amen, that I'm preaching out of. Uh, I've been studying it for years, um, and, and, and so it's gonna be given to you with a lot of diligence. But somebody might be asking in this room, like, why is this important to know? Why can't we just let it happen as it happens? Why, why is there so much you know, focus on, on, on this? And that's a real great question. And let me just say, there are many reasons why we should study and be studying the end of the world through scripture and, and having at least a, a foundation of knowledge concerning end times Bible prophecy, especially as it relates to the book of Revelation. In other words, why should we be studying this? Let me give you a few reasons. Number one, because there's blessing to studying this. There's blessing to this right here. Matter of fact, let's just go to Revelation chapter one and verse one right now and read one, two, and three of, of the first verses of Revelation one, where it says, the revelation from Jesus Christ. I mean, if Jesus Christ is bringing a rev revelation, come on, we need to be looking, we need to be listening, we need to be receiving it. It says, which God gave him to show his servants. Come on, how many are his servants in this room? what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, we're gonna talk about him next week, who testifies to everything he saw, that is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And watch this, verse three. Blessed is the one, come on, somebody say blessed. Who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear it and take heart to what is written in it. Friends, I believe the church today is missing out on these blessings because we're not reading these words aloud. We're not talking about this as much as we should be and could be. And we're not causing others to hear them and take them to heart. Can I tell you, there's blessing for you in this teaching. Isn't that what Jesus just said in verse three? Blessed are those who hear it. Come on, so how many receive that blessing right now? You, you have positioned yourself to hear it. You're blessed. If you read these words aloud, I don't know about you, but I'd read these words in your home. I'd read these words aloud, it says. That's why we should study and know this, because there's blessing attached to it. Number two, here's why we should study this, is because 25% of the Bible was prophecy when it was given. I don't know if you knew that or not, but one quarter of your Bible, when it was written, was not telling of events that were or that have happened. They were telling of events to come. So it's important to understand prophecy. Number three, here's why it's important to know this, is because knowledge of Bible prophecy saves people and motivates people to have a stronger faith in Jesus. The, the, the message, come on, the words, Jesus is coming back soon, Come on, is a message of focus. The message that the world is ending is one of priority and it just has an anointing on it that people respond to. And lastly, number four, here's why it's important to know this. It's important that you see and know the authority, come on, somebody say authority, and power, somebody say power, that is in the person of Jesus now. Come on, somebody say now. You see, the last time the world saw Jesus, physically, he was meek, he was homeless, he was on a cross, he was nailed to a beam asking for something to drink, only to be handed a, a, a sponge on top of a spear soaked in vinegar. Come on, he was bloodied, he was beaten, he was broken. Cut to Revelation chapter one. Where, where, where John writes, look at this in verse 12 of the first chapter, when John said, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, he says, I saw seven golden lampstands. We're gonna talk about those next week. But look at this. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head, it says, was white like Stan Roach. Come on, name what it says. 
It says, white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. I believe it's the New King James that says, intense burning torches or infernos. Look at this, friends. That's coming out of his eyes. It says his feet were like the bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven Stars and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double edged sword, his face like the sun shining in all its brilliance. And when I saw him, come on, how many would do what John did? I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me. My God, what did that feel like? And said, do not, come on, the, the sound of swords coming out when he speaks and rushing waters sounding when he, when he speaks. Do not be afraid. Okay. I am the first and the last. Come on. I am the living one. I was dead and now look. I am alive forever and ever, and I love this part, and I hold the keys to death and hell right there for what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. Come on, how many are thankful for who Jesus is today, friends? My friend, the authority of Jesus is supreme. Revelation chapter 2 says that Jesus rules with an iron scepter and dashes your enemy to pieces like broken pottery. The book of Revelation shows that in the end times, Jesus is assuredly Lord of all. He's not a savior dying on a cross anymore. Come on, somebody. He's a judge that grips the arms of a throne, and he is orchestrating the end of the old order of things, and he is creating for you and all those who know him a beautiful new beginning. And how many know everybody needs to know that? Somebody say a good amen if you believe that. The fact or the matter is this. You don't know Jesus until you see him in the book of Revelation. I've heard people, when they picture Jesus, you know what I mean? It's oftentimes the picture of Jesus is what we see shown to us in Renaissance paintings and depictions. That's not what I just read. That's who he really is, friends. And that's really, in my opinion, the biggest reveal of the book of Revelation. In fact, the word revelation comes from the Greek word apocalypsis. That's why we call the, that's where we get the word apocalypse from. You know what apocalypsis means? It literally means unveiling. It's like pulling a curtain back. Why? Because I want to show you what's on the other side of it. And that's what the book of Revelation is doing. And I love it that in the beginning, they're like, check this out, y'all. And you see a savior. Come on, with fire in his eyes and swords that come out of his mouth when he speaks. Rules with an iron scepter that, 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 that dashes your enemies to pieces like broken pottery. And so, along with the rest of Scripture, may I just say, this is our only authority that we serve when it comes to Bible prophecy. Amen? We don't put our hope in anything else. Can I say that one more time? We don't put our hope in anything else. That's why horoscopes are a joke and should not be a part of the life of any Christ follower. They're rooted in astrology. Oh, he's a Virgo. So what? Oh, you know how Sagittarius, all that is is astrology, friends. These are teachings that are not anchored in Christ at all that lead us in our eyes in other directions. Astrology has an end times message. And when you play around with that stuff, you're, you're playing around with that message and connecting your life to that message. That's why fortune tellers and mediums are a fraud because the world will always try and mimic the nature and abilities of God but will always and inevitably fall short in those efforts. A lot of people have been asking me about the solar eclipse. Dozens and dozens of videos that are being thrown all over the internet right now about the solar eclipse. Pastor, Pastor, did, did, did you hear about the solar eclipse? These videos with just scary music on it. You know, just 
Dun, dun, dun. Solar eclipse. Sip, 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 sip. Pastor, what, what are we supposed to say about solar eclipse? This is all I'm going to say about it. Be careful who you put your eyes to and who you put your ears to. Because there, again, there are videos right now that are showing, they'll tell you, man, the path of this eclipse coming into Texas, a city called Eagles Pass, and then there's a city named Jonah, and I literally heard a guy go, and then after that, there are seven Ninevehs. Come on, how many, have, how many have heard this stuff? Right, isn't it crazy? Look at the stuff that goes around. Seven Ninevehs that it's gonna pass over, and what the Lord is saying there is that, is that be, if, if they don't, if America doesn't repent like, like, like Nineveh did, then, then, then they're gonna, the uh, Lord's gonna do some bad things to America like he did to Nineveh. First off, there ain't even seven Ninevehs in America. Did you know that? Google maps it. So the guy's lying to you right off the jump. Like, again, anything sounds crazy when you put scary music and slap a couple scriptures on it. It's, it's all created to induce fear. Oh, because it's coming over the New Madrid fault line. Come on, I've never heard that before. And, there's, and I heard from somebody who knows somebody who has a dog that plays with my dog at the park. And, and then they have a cousin and their uncle's cousin's boyfriend. Man, they, 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 they know a seismologist that said, that, that, and a meteorologist, I think, too, at that. He said that, that the, when the solar eclipse, is, it's going to influence the New Madrid fault and, and a big earthquake's going to happen. How many have heard that before, too? Maybe not from the cousin's dog, but you know what I mean? You study seismology, meteorology, I mean, there's, there's, there's studies all over this, and it's available to you, that a solar eclipse, a total solar eclipse or any eclipse whatsoever has, watch this, 0% connection or influence on the crust of the earth. But again, scary music and scriptures, man, and new magic, because it connects to home here. We're like, man, it's gonna happen. Will there ever be an earthquake here? Probably. But is that what that means? Again, and it ties into this. Friends, this is all I'm saying. And plus, you know, we're not even seeing this eclipse because there's some cloud cover. So everybody just needs to calm down a little bit. Amen. My friends, all I'm saying is this. Be careful. I don't mean to say a lot of this in jest, but I'm not saying you can't pull meaning from things. But again, scary music and false and coincidental facts can stir up emotions that put people's eyes in the wrong directions. For instance, People hail guys like, 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 like Nostradamus. How many have ever heard of Nostradamus before? We're taught about this guy in school to be this great prophet and this great predictor of, of, of things to come. But when you look at this dude's prophecies, they are so generic and so coincidental, he's bound to get some of them right. Let me, let me read to you one of his prophecies. Ready? A natural disaster as never before seen will come upon us in the next 100 years. Of course it's going to be like never before seen because it ain't never happened before. Let me read another one. A major world leader will die in the next 20 years. Of course one's going to die in the next 20, 20 years. Listen, this... Let's just get him off the screen, amen. Because that's the real message of the end times right there. If that ain't anchored to what it is you're seeing, you're connected to the wrong message. That's why I stick to this right here. Because this right here hits the center of the target every single time it shoots. Did you know in the book of Daniel, which was written 165 B.C., before Christ, Daniel not only prophesied the coming of Jesus, he also prophesied the second coming of Jesus, but when he prophesied the coming of Jesus, he also prophesied the events surrounding the coming of Jesus and said that he will come to Jerusalem before he dies. And he, watch this, he prophesied the very day it would happen. He prophesied Palm Sunday to the day. My friends, this is unbeaten. And this is just one of thousands of examples I could give you. I could go on and on and on. But this is dead on, dead right every single time. How is that possible? How, how could Daniel know that? 
It's because we serve a God who created all that we know, time, space, and matter. And if he created time, then that means he exists outside of the framework of time as we know it to be. And he sees the end from every angle of his sight. We, however, are subservient to time. We, we cannot see ahead unless we're connected to the one who can. So don't get caught up or, 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 or committed to anything other than the Bible when it comes to end time knowledge, amen? I love how Pastor John Hagee writes it. He's a great teacher uh, on the end times. And he says, the book of Revelation is, is, is the history of the future. <laughs> I love that right there. And it's not a horror story. Come on. That's why we got nice music. I don't have Pastor Rudy going, dun, dun, dun. Right? It's not a horror story. It's a victory story. Come on, somebody. This is not a book right here about the Antichrist. It's about Jesus Christ. Somebody say a good amen. And... And if we're fo focused more on the arrival of the Antichrist than we are on the arrival of Jesus Christ, then we've got our eyes in the wrong direction. This is about the victory of Jesus Christ and his church over the devil and his schemes to separate us from God. And this book shows us just how badly those schemes will fail in the end. Friends, this story ends with you, if you're a Christ follower, this story ends with you reigning with Christ as kings, queens, and priests unto God forevermore in a new heaven and a new earth. I don't know what about that wouldn't excite the dickens out of you like it does me. I'm sweating like crazy up underneath this shirt right now because I'm excited, friends. Why? Because you're looking at a winner in this story. Come on. Look around. You're looking at winners in the story. You win, friends, in the end. And, and so this is, this is really, can we stand to our feet today? I'm all excited. I don't even know how to end this service right now. This is how, this is how I want to end this first message today, which we're going to dig into some stuff here in this series, but but I just wanted to set the course at the beginning and set the tone at the beginning that, that I pray that you just be released from fear concerning the end of the world. Because again, friends, Jesus wins, Satan loses. And if Jesus wins and you're with Jesus, that means you win in the end. I said, if you're a believer, you win in the end. And yeah, we're gonna dig into some intense stuff in the weeks to come. We're gonna walk through a gauntlet of, of craziness as we talk about the tribulation period, the arrival of the Antichrist, where he's gonna come from. We're gonna talk about the mark of the beast and, and, and the seals, trumpets, and bowls of wrath. We're gonna talk about the battle of Armageddon, the bottomless pit, uh, and then some. But all of it serves to take you to the most amazing and storied victorious end that could ever be won, where Jesus defeats and does away with the devil, the enemy of your soul, once and for all, that sin will be buried underneath the grounds of hell once and for all, evil and suffering and pain and anxiety and depression and worry will be buried in a devil's hell once and for all, never to touch you and I again. Come on, somebody, that's the story, and that's the bottom line, because Jesus Christ said so. Somebody break some glass in honor of WrestleMania right now, amen. That's what it's about. That's what it's about, but, but again, that's, that's a victory that only exists for those who have given their life to Jesus. That's it, and Revelation is clear on that. Boy, is there a line drawn in this book. Can I say it this way? The end of the world is not a choice. It's happening. But where you end up in the end of this story is absolutely a choice. And it's a choice that only you can make. And maybe you're in this place today and that's a choice you'd like to make right now. Matter of fact, 
I just would like to ask everybody in this room, just, to, just out of honor in this moment, just to bow your heads and close your eyes. I'm not gonna ask anybody to come up here or anything like that. I just wanna encourage you to have the most powerful moment you could possibly have with God right there in your seat. But friends, maybe you're here today and you have never given your life to Jesus. And if that's the case, that's probably why you were invited here by somebody that cares about you or, or God set up circumstances for you to be here in this moment so that you could choose him. Because again, all those who choose him, watch me, in the end are saved and brought to a beautiful story of victory. But if you haven't, so if you're in this place today, friends, and you'd like to give your life to Jesus, you'd, you wanna ensure that you're ready for the end of the world as we know it. You'd like to do that by giving your life to the one who's gonna put an end to it all and create a new beginning and you wanna be part of his new beginning. If that's you, I'm gonna to count to three. When I say three, I wanna encourage you to raise your hand just, just out of you making a move to let God know I'm serious about this decision. And if that's you, I encourage you to make that one, two, Three, anybody in this room? Thank you, thank you. Hands coming up all across this auditorium, hallelujah. There's over a dozen people in the last service that made this decision as well, wow. You can put your hands down after you put them up. Thank you, Lord, for the decisions in this room of people that say, that's me, I wanna choose Jesus. If you raised your hand in this room, I wanna encourage you to pray a prayer with me because here's how we do this, friends. We just, we stick to the Bible and your Bible says in Romans chapter 10 and verse nine that if you would confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead for you, you will be saved. That's how simple it is, friends. And so let's do that in this moment. Let's, let's put that verse in a prayer and just make a statement to Jesus from your life. And I wanna ask everybody in this room if they would, just out of honor for those that raise their hands to pray this with them. Would you just repeat these words after me? Say, Lord Jesus, I believe. You bled and died for me. I believe you rose again for me. So today I give you me. I give you my life and I receive your forgiveness into my life for all my sin. Thank you for loving me like no one else could and for giving me heaven forever with you like no one else could. I love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Can we give it up for the people in this room that prayed that prayer? Because if you prayed that prayer and meant it, your Bible says you're saved, friends. You're a winner in the end of this story. Hallelujah, amen. The Bible says all of heaven rejoices when one sinner goes to repent to God, amen. That means angels are partying right now in your name, amen. And that's why you hear that applause and celebration around your life, because we're just so honored that you shared that decision and that you allowed us to be in the room with you when you made it. If you did pray that prayer, I encourage you to know that you made the best first step you could ever take, amen. Matter of fact, in the seat back in front of you, there's a little card, you can pull it out if you want to and fill it out and scribble the information asked and put it in that offering box on the way out or give it to somebody at the connect spot. Just let us know you made that decision because we'd love to help you grow and what the next steps look like and how you can grow in your relationship with Jesus. Because I'm telling you, there's incredible reward for Christians and we want to set you up for that the best we know how. We got Bible reading plans for you. We got, we got all kinds of great resource that'll just help you grow in your faith. We encourage you to do that today. But let's just, let's just close this moment today with a, a, a time of honor. We're going to sing a song here and and, and this is how we'll close this service. And we're just gonna honor Jesus and the power that he has for our lives today through the end of all time. Because how many know again, he's, he's not the, the, the skinny, olive skin, suffering savior that we see depicted on Renaissance paintings. My friends, he's got fire in his eyes and a sword that exits his mouth when he speaks. And for those that have given their lives to him, which we just saw people do in this room, he speaks blessing and victory and protection over you and yours, amen? How many receive that in Jesus' name? Come on, how many are thankful that the victory is always and will always belong to Jesus? So Jesus, we, 
We thank you for who you are. We thank you for how you love us all. We thank you that before we dig into all the intensity of the events happening in the book of Revelation, we thank you that you're the author of all of it and there's purpose to all of it. So we choose today to look to you in all of it. And as we look to you, God, we trust that you are the God who is simply trying to author a brand new beginning that leads us to heaven with you forever. That's the ultimate definition of victory that we could ever have. Thank you for it all. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Come on, let's worship. Let's worship.